I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and make your way to uh, Matthew chapter 21. We will take a break, um, as you see on the screen before you, from Romans over the course of the next couple weeks. So we'll pick up where we left off in Romans the week after Easter. Uh, today we will spend our time in the first portion of Matthew 21, uh, talking about what we call Palm Sunday or the, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem for the final time. And so we'll start there, and actually, I want you to hold your place there, and in a minute, we'll flip somewhere else, um, and I'll, I'll tell you where we get to that, but it will be on the screen, too. If you don't want to flip, you just want to follow along, you can, but uh, we'll spend our Palm Sunday portion in, in Matthew 21, but we will set the stage for Matthew 21 by looking at an Old Testament passage here in just a couple of minutes. But uh, today, as we've said, as you see on the screen before you, it's, it's what we call Palm Sunday. Um, Jesus enters into Jerusalem for the final time. And as he enters into Jerusalem for the final time, he's hailed as the king. And, and as we're going to see in a minute, there's uh, palm branches involved and there's this celebration. And that's where we get the idea of uh, Palm Sunday. <clears throat> but what's happening here is we think about Jesus entering into Jerusalem for the final time is it's the, the setting is that it's the week of the Passover. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the Passover was a feast and it was one of three pilgrimage feasts uh, that the nation of Israel had to observe. Excuse me. Pilgrim, these pilgrimage feasts <clears throat> required all of the Jewish males to travel to Jerusalem to participate in this feast. And so your three pilgrimage fe uh, festivals or feasts were the Feast of Unleavened Bread, also known as the Passover, so that's where we're at today, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So again, you had three times a year that Jewish men and their families, no matter where they were from or where they live now, excuse me, they would sojourn, they would make their way to Jerusalem to partake in these feasts. They would make the pilgrimage that's why these feasts are known as the pilgrimage feast. And so it would be during this time that all the Jewish males, as they make their way, they're coming to celebrate the Passover. They're coming to celebrate this feast that has been set up and established as a designation um, to remind Israel of what God had done for them and to keep them from forgetting what God had done for them. We've talked a little bit about that as we've been in the book of Romans, and we talked about spiritual amnesia and how quickly we forget who God is and how quickly we forget the things that God has done. And so we have, we have this whole feast that's been set up to help remind the Jews of, of a, a one really significant particular event in their past. Now, the word Passover derives from a word meaning, are you ready for this? Pass over. It's exactly what you would think it is. <clears throat> it's designed to, <clears throat> excuse me, remind those who would hear it of the fact that there is a time in Israel's history when God passed over them. One major event in the history of Israel that people ought to, as we learn God's word, the Jews especially, that we ought to, our minds go to, we ought to think of when we think about this idea of Passover or the Lord passing over. And if you're familiar with the Old Testament, then you know we're talking about the Exodus. You know that we're talking about when the people had been in bondage, in slavery, under Pharaoh, and they were oppressed, and they were treated unfairly, and they didn't get wages, they were slaves, and they worked hard, and God raises up Moses, and he sends Moses into Pharaoh, and he says, I want you to go get my people, I've heard their cry, and I want you to go get them. And so, again, if you're familiar, you know Moses goes in, and he goes to Pharaoh, and he says, hey, God says, let his people go. Uh, we're, we're here to take them out. And, and, and Pharaoh says no. And so what ends up happening is there's a series of plagues or judgments that take place where God judges Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Pharaoh's refusal to do what God has called them to do. He would not allow the Jews to leave Egypt to go and to worship the Lord. And so 
God sends these plagues or he sends these judgments. One of the things that I would submit to you is the most amazing about the plagues is that Israel was not affected by them. It was clear that this was God acting on behalf of Israel or acting on behalf of the Jews in judgment against Pharaoh. And so here's, I want to read a portion of scripture from Exodus 12. So if you want to turn there with me, you can. It'll be on the screen if you just want to follow along there. But this is where we see nine plagues have transpired. And the tenth plague is coming. But the tenth plague requires some preparation from the nation of Israel. And so here's what we read in Exodus chapter 12. Now Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are to each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you are to apportion the lamb. Your lamb shall be a male, without blemish, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. And they shall eat the flesh at night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Passover of Yahweh. And I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And I will see the blood and I will pass over you. And there shall be no plague among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This Passing over, climaxed the tenth and final plague where the angel of the Lord struck down the oldest son in every family in Egypt. From the rich, that is Pharaoh, the most wealthy Pharaoh, the king, down to the poor. If we were to continue reading, we would read that even those who were in jail, the oldest from their family was struck down by the Lord. The oldest of the livestock was struck down by the Lord of the families that did not have the blood of the lamb smeared on the doorpost. At midnight, any dwelling that did not have the blood, the oldest son was killed in every household in Egypt. This was the Passover. Every home that had the blood, the angel of the Lord passed over. Their, their, their firstborn was saved from death. And this salvation that was coming to these, ultimately that would come to Israel, but in this tenth plague to the, the oldest, the firstborn of each family, right? It's, it's, a, it's a savior from, it's a saving rather from the oppressive rule of Egypt, but it's a saving into something else. The Israelites being saved into the next I don't want to call it the phase, but stage of their existence. God has called them out of Egypt, and he is taking them into a new land. And this had to happen in order for them to come out of Egypt and to be taken into the land that God had promised them. And this would not be the last time that the Jews would be under the oppressive rule of a tyrant. Again, in this case, it's Pharaoh in Egypt. It's not the last time, though, that the Jews would find themselves in need of a savior. In fact, in the very moments of what takes place in our text this morning, in our setting of Palm Sunday, we find that the nation of Israel, the Jews, are in need of a Savior. And because if we're familiar with God's Word at all, we know what the end, the end result, we know what the outcome of this week is, so we also know that they missed it. 
They missed it. They were under the rule of, of oppression. They got that part. But God had sent a Savior to them, and they missed it, and they dealt harshly with him. They killed him. And so we know that they missed what God had, 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 had brought to them to deliver them, to be the Savior that they needed. But they missed it. And so back to Palm Sunday. Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. It is his triumphal entry. He comes into town on a colt, that is, a baby donkey. This was the sign of a king's arrival, which explains the response of the people to Jesus, right? We'll see in just a second when we read our text that they are shouting and they are praising him as he enters into town. They are waving palm branches, and in some cases they're laying these branches on the ground in front of Jesus and the colt as they make their way into Jerusalem. Again, this is where we get the name for the events of today as Palm Sunday. The Jews, they were celebrating God's working in their history. But this year, the Passover was different. Their king was coming to Passover. And the people would be as free as they were nearly a couple thousand years prior when God outstretched his mighty hand upon the nation of Egypt. And the people, they were ready to be free and the guy on the colt was the one who would be able to deliver their freedom. The triumphal entry of Jesus actually appears in all four of our Gospels. We won't read all four of them this morning, but to give us a context as we make our way through this event, uh, we will read the first 11 verses of Matthew 21. So if you found your way there, I invite you to follow along with me as I read. If, if you don't have your Bible or you've not made your way there, it will be on the screen as well. It says, and when they had approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. And this took place in order that what was spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a pack animal. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their garments on them and he sat on the garments. And most of the crowd spread their garments in the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. And the crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were crying out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred saying, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This morning is my goal that we together will see who it was that the Jews wanted Jesus to be as he entered into Jerusalem for this final time. But also we'll see if who the Jews wanted Jesus to be is actually who Jesus revealed himself to be. So let's start by looking at who it was the Jews wanted Jesus to be. The Jews were looking for a savior, and rightfully so. They were in need, and God had promised an answer to that need. On the surface, it would seem that Jesus was exactly who they wanted him to be. And they address him in a couple of ways this morning. First, as we sang and we see here, they address him uh, with the term, the phrase, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest is, is, is what they would shout as Jesus was making his way into Jerusalem. This is an Old Testament expression meaning, save us, we beseech thee. They're literally proclaiming as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, Hosanna, that is to say, save us, Jesus. Jesus, save us. They're pleading with him. It is fair to say. The Jews understand their plight. They're under the rule of the Roman government. They can't do anything that the Roman government doesn't allow them to do. And the, the primary concern with the Roman government is just peace in the land. And we'll see that later this week. When Jesus stands before Pilate, the governor, whose primary job there in Judea was to keep order, was to keep peace, right? And, and so they understand their situation as they exist underneath the Roman government. They want to be freed. And they're pleading with Jesus to be the king who would 
save them, who would free them. They proclaim these things with a, a sense of urgency. Imagine with me, if you could, a scene of approximately two million people. That's what's estimated how many Jews would have been in Jerusalem for the Passover. Two million people. And everybody wouldn't have been there as he made his way into the city. The text tells us as they got in, some of the people said, who is this? What's going on? But nonetheless, there is a, a massive multitude of people who are, 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 are creating a scene. They're causing a ruckus. They're worshiping. They're calling for the one who is entering into the city to be the one who would save them. And because they knew they had this need, and they knew there was a man coming into town riding on a, a donkey, which was the appropriate response of a king returning from battle who had been victorious. He's making his way home. He would come in riding on, a, on an animal, and the people would celebrate, and they would welcome the king back. So the people here is in Israel, as Jesus is making his way in, they've seen him do these miracles. His earthly ministry has been going on for three years at this point. He's been teaching, casting out demons, healing sick people, healing blind people, giving a voice to the mute. I mean, he's been doing all these things for three years, and here he comes now riding on a colt. And these people say, look, man, if anybody can do it, it's this guy. Because look at what he's done in his three years since, you know, his time come where who he was was revealed. And he's done all these great things, and now he's riding on a colt. And so it's fitting that we're saying, this is our king, this is our savior, so save us now, crying out that he might save them. But it carried this term, Hosanna, carried with it a, a special significance. It wasn't just a word that meant we need to be saved. But the significance of the Hosanna spoke to the, the, the messianic nature. There was an understanding that they had as these dots, as we said, were, were lining up. And so they're directing this worship towards this one. It was a declaration of the confidence of the Lord's salvation in a time of need. The people were recognizing Jesus as their Messiah. He had finally come and he was going to set them free from Rome's oppression, just as God had set them free previously from the oppression of Pharaoh in Egypt. But it's not just Hosanna. They also refer to him with the name of the son of David to further the reality that the Jews were looking for someone who was coming to not only free them from Rome, but to establish a kingdom. They refer to him as the son of David. This again is an indication that is used to denote the idea that this guy was the Messiah. That this Jesus coming in, he, he's the Messiah. He's going to do this thing that nobody else could do. He's going to free us. He's going to bring us the freedom and the peace that we have longed for, that has been promised, that the Messiah would bring to us. The belief was that this man riding on a colt was going to establish his kingdom. He was going to bring them their peace, their freedom, and their glory. Now, they were correct in one way, and that Jesus would be the one who would do those things. But it wasn't at that time. Jesus didn't ride into Jerusalem that final time at his triumphal entry to instill an earthly kingdom. What Jesus came to do and accomplish would not be carried out or accomplished the way that the Jews wanted it done in that moment. So they're correct in some capacity they understand some things about this Jesus. They understand some things about Old Testament prophecy and then being fulfilled in the man who was a Messiah, but they clearly didn't understand what was transpiring. They clearly did not understand what it was that Jesus ultimately was bringing to them. And what do we make of this? What do we say about a re the reception that Jesus received from the people? There's not a lot of times in Scripture when I, I can so, my mind so readily goes to how quickly people flip from one side to the other. It's Sunday, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, and it's Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Son of David, save us. This is our Messiah. And it takes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 
Friday. It takes five days for these same people to go from Hosanna, son of David, save us, to crucify him. Crucify him. It's clear something's missing between here and here as it relates to the people. We know they want to be saved, but we learn that what Jesus was offering, the salvation that he was coming to bring, was not the salvation they wanted. It was not what they believed their greatest need was. You see, on this side of history, with the completed canon of God's word, we know that while the Jews wanted to be saved, they wanted to be saved from Rome. But that's not why Jesus came. He came not to overthrow Rome, but to bring peace with God. And the interesting thing about him coming to bring peace with God to the people who were claiming we want peace is that they rejected the one who brought that peace. The peace with God was far and away their greatest need. But that was their greatest desire. Their, their, but that was not their greatest desire. Their greatest need was peace with God, but their greatest desire was peace from Rome. And when our desires are mixed up, when our priorities are out of whack, things go awry. Remember, it took five days. They didn't realize at the time that Jesus come to bring them peace with the Father because at the end of the day, they thought they were okay. We have peace with God. The Pharisees used to tell Jesus prior to this things like, our father is Abraham. We have peace with God because of our lineage. We're Jewish by nature and, and because we observe sacrifices and because we partake in, in feasts, because we do these things and we're of the line of Abraham, we have peace with God. So they wanted an earthly king. But when Jesus came, peace with God came not through sacrifices and not through lineages. Peace with God came by faith in Jesus Christ. Who he was, why he came, what he, come to, what he came to accomplish. You know, if I could summarize who the Jews wanted Jesus to be, it would be that. The Jews wanted Jesus to be a political savior, not a spiritual one, not, not a savior who would heal spiritual needs and bridge gaps that had been broken by sin and can be bridged no other way. They wanted somebody who would free them politically. And I think about these things, I think about a political savior, and I find myself, maybe you're like me, maybe you're not, I find myself asking questions of myself. What about me? Is Jesus just a means to an end? Do I find it convenient to worship this Jesus the way that I want him to be with the things that I, I, I like? Uh, I, I ran across a really good illustration last night, and I have to give credit where credit is due. Thank you, Roger. Um, but Roger and I were having a conversation, and he was, we were talking about, you know, kind of some of this stuff about approaching Jesus. And he said, you know, it's interesting because I feel like a lot of people treat Jesus like they treat Subway. They walk in, they order their sandwich, and then they go on down the line, and they say, yeah, that's no good for me, so I don't want that part. Yeah, that's a hard pill to swallow, so don't put that on my sandwich. Yeah, this is a difficult thing to navigate, so we're just going to go ahead and leave that one off. But all of the things that make me feel good or that I really like the taste of, go ahead and saturate my sub with those things, right? And, and not that my intention is just to make this about fast food, but we've created a Burger King Jesus. You get to have it your way. That wasn't Roger's, that was mine. He can have the subway. Burger King was mine. And you know, the interesting thing about God's word is we'll look at God's word and we'll say, man, I can't believe the Jews would do that. I mean, after all, these are the people who saw God pass over their families and strike down the firstborn of every family that didn't have the blood spread, the blood of a lamb spread on a doorpost. And, and yet, now they're in, the, they're, they're in Jerusalem, and they're in this land, and, and, and they've forgotten everything that God did. 
And we say, I can't believe that they would be like that. Guys, we got to be careful. Because we're just like them. When was the last time you were reading through your Bible and you encountered something that was a really difficult truth? But it met you right where you are and you knew in the moment when you read that it was calling you to change. And you had a choice to make in that moment. I will humbly submit before the Lord or I will arrogantly in my pride continue on. And, and guys, this is not foreign to the church. In fact, I'm convinced more people in churches like ours function this way than they do this way. Reading God's word is not about understanding who God is and what he's revealed to us and who he's called us to be and how he's called us to, to be changed through the power of his spirit and live our lives for, for his glory and the good of those around us. We just read the hard stuff. We're like, uh, yeah, but I like doing this, so I'm just going to keep going. And we try to have things our way. We embrace the parts of Jesus that we like. We embrace the parts that comfort us in our sinful behaviors, actions, and thought life. And we have no time for the things that, 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 that call us out of that. We surround ourselves with people who think like we do so that they can encourage us in our bad habits and they can encourage us in our wrong thinking. Guys, we're no different than the Jews who hailed Jesus as the man and five days later said, kill him, nail him to that tree. There is an awareness with which those who say they belong to Jesus must live their lives following what Jesus has said. We live in a, a take what you want, leave what you don't Christian world, and Jesus said, if you are to be my disciple, you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. None of denying, taking up a cross, and following sounds like take what you want, leave what you don't. And there's hundreds of thousands, as many, I don't know how many is there as he's coming in, but we know about two million people in the city there's hundreds of thousands, up to maybe 200 million people who are taking what they want of Jesus and we're going to find they leave the rest. It's not about who Jesus was. It's not about what he came to do. It was about Jesus being a means to an end for the Jews. And guys, this is one of the most common things I see in counseling. This is not something that only happens outside of the church. Brothers and sisters, many of our lives are not changed by the truth of God's word and the power of the Holy Spirit because we don't live our lives according to them for the glory of God. We live our lives trying to live according to them because we view them as a means to an end. Well, the preacher said, if I do this, my life will get better. Well, you need a new preacher because I didn't tell you that. And anybody who does is selling you a bill of goods. Nobody can promise you that it's going to get better if you follow Jesus. But I can assure you it won't get better if you are following Jesus as a means to an end. We don't get to decide who we want Jesus to be. Jesus has determined, the Father has determined who Jesus is and what Jesus would do. And it's vital that we understand that we're not... It's not okay, like we're not allowed to just live in outright denial of who Jesus is. But it's equally as dangerous and not okay to live our lives confused about who Jesus is. Sometimes we just don't know. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to act like everybody just knows God's word inside and out and lives contrary to it. That's not what I'm saying. Sometimes we don't know. But that's why we need to be engaging with the word of God, that we might know what Jesus is like, that we might know what Jesus has accomplished, that we might understand how these things apply to our lives. And that's why the second thing that we see here this morning is so important, because it's not about who we want Jesus to be, but rather it's about who Jesus has revealed himself to be. See, that's the reality here. It's not, I guess if I could continue with the sub analogy you go to, you all know Jimmy John's, it's freaky fast is what they say. Well, you know part of the reason J Jimmy John's is so fast? Because you can't change the sub. 
At least you didn't used to be able to. You picked the number you wanted, they made it as it was on the board, and that was it. I was in there one time and asked if I could get mustard. They said, we'll give it to you in a packet. I had to put it on my own sub. I don't know how Jimmy John's has survived. But you went to Jimmy John's, and you get what Jimmy John's says you get based on what Jimmy John's menu says. It's not like Subway. You don't get to pick and choose. And so it is with Jesus. We don't get to pick and choose. We take Jesus for who he, who he has revealed himself to be. And it's interesting, right? Because one of the ways that we know Jesus has been revealed is as a prophet. And the people even acknowledge it as such. In verse 11, and the crowds were saying, so go to, go to verse 10. It says, and when he had entered Jerusalem, the crowds were stirred. And they said, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And Jesus had a, a earthly ministry. It lasted about three years. He lived about 30 years before that ministry began. And part of that earthly ministry was as a prophet. Jesus came and he spoke on behalf of the Father. He was and he is the Word. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we know if we continue through John's gospel, the word incarnate is Jesus. Jesus always has been God. Jesus still is God. And Jesus always will be God, fully, right? And so he comes, fully God, fully man, speaking on behalf. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? And so he comes and he speaks during his public ministry on behalf of the Father, as a prophet, he taught, he healed, he cast out demons, he worked on behalf of the Father to the glory of his Father, to the good of his, or his, to his, to the good of the people. I think about, I've been reading through the Gospel of Mark with a young man here in the church, and each day we read one chapter of the Gospel of Mark, and uh, and then we talk about it, and you know it's in Mark where. Um, I, I was somewhere around Mark 7, Mark 8, I don't forgot now, I've slept in the last few days, um, where you have this scene where Jesus gets out of the boat and, uh, and there's a demoniac in the, in the caves, right? <clears throat> and he's all chained up and the people are like, man, this dude's so out of control, there's demons that are in him, uh, there, nobody can do anything. We can't do anything to change this guy's situation, like he's harming himself, himself with the chains and the class and they break him and they they try to put him back in there and i sell that to say that this is one of the extreme examples of somebody being uh, controlled or possessed by a demon and what we see is when jesus gets out of the boat he has compassion he interacts with this demon who's within this man and then this demon that nobody could do anything about jesus cast out cast it into a herd of pigs and the herd of pigs runs down into the sea. You know, Jesus in his earthly ministry, you know, he raised people from the dead. We're all familiar with Lazarus, John chapter 11, you know, but, but what about Jairus, the, the, the uh, Jewish leader whose daughter had died? And Jesus goes to their home and Jesus raises her back to life. Again, we've mentioned, you know, you think about people losing their sight or not having sight and it being given back. I was having a conversation this week with a guy we've been talking through some stuff and I have a lot of conversations about God's sovereignty and even God's sovereignty over the weather. We think about Jesus' earthly public ministry where he acted and taught on behalf of God. I think of that scene in the boat where Jesus is with the disciples and the storm rolls in and they're terrified. They're going to die. And Jesus rebukes the storm and the waves stop and the wind quits blowing and the men in the boat say, who is this man that even the wind and the seas obey him? That's the man who has entered into Jerusalem for the final time. Who has come speaking and working on behalf of his father. He didn't just do miracles, he taught. Right? Matthew 5-7, through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' first public teaching. You know, we've got Jesus' sermon on the Mount of Olives, also recorded for us here a couple chapters later in, in, in Matthew's gospel. You know, he taught of things like the coming kingdom of God. Jesus warned of pending judgment. These are the kinds of things that Jesus taught, 
talking about Jesus come to encourage people, to draw them near, that they might come to know and understand. Jesus is still ministering today, praise the Lord, not in a public earthly sense that he's walking amongst us. Uh, But you know, Jesus, I don't want to be fanciful and I don't want this to go off the rails, but Jesus is still working miracles. And I'm not talking about in the sense of what we see dominating the church today, but you know, if, if you thought about life, and that's a miracle. I'm not a scientist, and I don't understand all of the ins and outs of the process of a baby going from a single cell um, into something that, that, that is a living being immediately that grows and develops faculties. Uh, the, the whole process of life is a miracle. What about the process of salvation? Talk about Je- Jesus working, right? What about salvation? This is a miracle. If you think you being dead in your sin and being made alive in Christ is anything other than a miracle, then you don't understand your salvation. Because you couldn't do it. You couldn't change your situation. You could not correct the plight that you lived in. Only God could do that. Because only God has the ability to make dead things alive. Both in making life, but also in making things that are dead, people spiritually dead, making them spiritually alive. Jesus is still at work. Yes, he's not walking amongst us as he did here in the first century, but he, was, he still ministers. And as he ministered physically for those three years, he was described as things like the word, a servant, and perhaps my favorite, the Lamb of God. Because Jesus wasn't just a prophet. Jesus was a priest. He functioned as a priest. The book of Hebrews tells us that he functions as our great high priest. Okay? And so when we think of this, this reality of Jesus and, and him functioning as a priest, I told you just a second ago that perhaps my favorite rendering of Jesus is that of Lamb of God. And this is how John introduced, John the Baptist introduces him. If we went to John's gospel in chapter 1, verse 14, we see John is writing for us that John the Baptist, he's out there and he's by the river and he's talking and things going on. Jesus has been baptized and then it tells us in the next morning, John's talking and Jesus is walking by and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If we went, we won't for the sake of time, back to the book of Exodus, what kind of animal was it? that the Jews in Egypt were instructed to kill and spread its blood on the doorpost. It was a lamb. You see, the lamb was the animal that was given to be a payment or atonement for sin. When John said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I mean, this is the highest of high titles that could be given to Jesus. He, this is the one who will be the sacrifice to do what nobody else could do once and for all. Yeah, they could continue to go to the temple and make a sacrifice to the animals once a year. Excuse me, make a sacrifice to the the high priest of animals once a year. But what people would come to learn is that Jesus was coming to fulfill that. You wouldn't have to take a lamb to the temple once a year anymore because Jesus is the lamb. Jesus is the priest. Jesus is the one who made the sacrifice. Jesus is the one who intercedes on behalf of his people. That's what the high priest did. He interceded. The people did not have the ability to go into the temple and make their own sacrifices. They had to bring them to the priest who would make the sacrifice for them. Okay? Now, I need you guys to understand something. Okay? There's one priest. His name is Jesus. Okay? It's never my desire to be, uh, to be belligerent or obtuse, but the only priest we need is Jesus. He is the intercessor between us and the Father. Paul is very clear to Timothy that there is one mediator, there is one intercessor between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus functions as this priest. 
He was the sacrifice that he willingly offered himself and he continues even to this day in this very moment to intercede on behalf of his people seated at the right hand of the Father. The book of Hebrews tells us that as our great high priest, he's able to sympathize with all of our weaknesses. And because so, he invites us to draw near, to draw into the very presence of God through Jesus that we might find grace in a time of need because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has accomplished. Not only are we invited, we're encouraged We're encouraged to enter into the presence of the Father through faith in Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Why? Because he's that great high priest who made atonement once and for all. And thirdly, he was prophet, he was priest, he was king. He's king. A king, as we've said is what the Jews of Jesus' day wanted. But ironically, their king is the one whom they rejected. We said a moment ago, Jesus is currently seated at the right hand of the Father. And nothing, nothing is outside of his authority. And one day he's going to return. And when he does, he is going to reign and rule as king. And he will establish a throne that will last forever and ever. But you know, as we have this conversation and we think about an earthly king and an earthly kingdom being set up, before this everlasting kingdom is established, Jesus will reign as a king with an iron fist. He will judge all iniquity once and for all. Every earthly king and every ruler will be overthrown. A time when the king that the Jews were awaiting will arrive in the capacity that they desired. They missed him because they wanted a political savior. And the dilemma for them was that Jesus came as their spiritual savior. He didn't come to free him from Rome. He came to free him from the penalty and bondage of sin. He came to free them from what death, or excuse me, what sin brings with it, death. He came as a spiritual savior. He'll come again, as we've said, still as spiritual savior, but also as king and judge. And so as we think about Jesus, and we think about how Jesus is revealed to us in scripture, a prophet, a priest, a king, I would ask you, Have you recognized Jesus as such? When you think of Jesus, do you think of a prophet, a priest, a king? Honestly, if 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 we're if we're on the same page this morning, most of us probably stop with thinking of him as prophet. He came and he did good things, and he taught good things, and he and he was God and he came. And probably we enter into the priest part, right? Because we understand that he came and he taught, and what did he do? He died for sin. That's the prophet and the priest. And we kind of stop there. Do we recognize Jesus as king, as Lord? Do we recognize Jesus and how he's revealed in Scripture? Do we, do we recognize Jesus as he came and presented himself? Or do we recognize Jesus for what we want him to be? Or what we would like him to be? You see, the reality is you don't have a biblical Jesus if you don't have all three. He can't just be a prophet. He can't just be a priest. He can't just be a king. There's a lot of kings, but there's only one king of kings, right? And so we've got to understand that to have an accurate picture of who Jesus is, to have a right understanding of what Jesus accomplished, we have to have the fullness of Jesus in all of his capacities, prophet, priest, king. Do you understand this morning when you think of Jesus as priest, his priestly ministry, that your salvation is based only on the atoning work of Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God? If your salvation consists of Jesus, but you don't have salvation. 
Because Jesus alone is the means of salvation. If we're adding anything to Jesus, we no longer have Jesus. We have manipulated or twisted or contrived something of our own imagination or doing. Our salvation, the primary work of his priestly ministry, is accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection, and our faith in that and nothing else. But that doesn't mean that we just live however we want. We'll get to it in Romans where Paul says, so should we sin so that grace could abound all the much more? No. In fact, Paul says, may it never be. It's the strongest form of no that existed in the Greek language. And this is the breakdown for a lot of us. We like what Jesus taught in some cases. We want him as our priest because we need salvation, but we're not interested in him as king. We're not interested in Jesus having authority over our lives. We're not interested in understanding and embracing that we are accountable to God. Not just for our sin that Jesus died for, but in our day-to-day lives. How we live our lives matters. And no, I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about adding a bunch of things to God's word so that we could be declared or feel better about being right before God. No, I'm simply talking about just living what God's word says. We don't need to add to it and we don't need to take from it. We just need to do what it says. We need to live our lives to the glory of God and the good of those around us because that's what God has called us to do. They said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we've been there in Romans 1, right? And and then completely unprompted, he said, and the second greatest commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus said. But to love God means we do it on his terms. To love people means we do it on God's terms. He has the authority to speak that into our lives through his word. This is what he expects. There is a, a, like, I'm sorry if you believe or have been told that God doesn't have expectations of you. Look, he does. He does. He has expectations for those who name the name of Jesus and the way that they would live their lives. We don't have to add to God's word because there's plenty of it there for us. But how we live our lives is a demonstration of what we believe to be true about who Jesus revealed himself to be. Prophet, priest, king. He's coming back to reign as a king. Spiritually, he reigns as a king now. And so I would ask you one simple question as we finish. Which Jesus do you want? The one of your own imagination the one of your own making, the one of your comforts and your conveniences, which I want you to know is no Jesus at all. It's just idolatry. Or do you want the Jesus of Scripture? Prophet, priest, and king who came, who worked, who's reigning, and who will rule one day in an earthly sense. He's still ruling now, but he will rule in an earthly sense one day. Which Jesus do you want? And then I would ask you, Another question. I said just one, but I'm going to ask you one more. Because I believe that there's a tendency for us to go with the Sunday school answer. We all know what the right answer to the question is. Do we want the Jesus of our own making, which you just spent 45 minutes telling us is no Jesus at all? Or do we want the Jesus of Scripture? Well, yes, I'll take the Jesus of Scripture. It's just like when you ask a four-year-old, do you want to trust Jesus so you don't go to hell? Well, you just got done telling me how awful hell was. Yes, I want to trust Jesus and not go to hell. Okay, that's the Sunday school answer. So the next question is, if we say we want the Jesus of Scripture, my follow-up question is this. Does your life represent it? Brothers and sisters, if it don't, the clear step for you to take today is to repent is to turn from sin and to understand this threefold ministry that Jesus came and taught and lived out and brought. It was a revelation of who he was and why he came and what he was accomplishing. And if we're living anything other than that, the only appropriate response is repentance. 
That's the change of mind that results in a, a change of direction where I say, I used to do this, and I used to think this, and I only wanted the good parts that I liked. I only wanted the easy parts of Jesus, but I understand it doesn't work that way. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into God's word, and I'm going to surround myself with people who think godly thoughts and who, who, who help me to, to live a godly life, and I'm going to follow after Jesus, the Jesus of Scripture. That's what's at stake this morning. If we are confused about Jesus, the consequences are catastrophic. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, when those came to him and they said, Lord, did we, did we, I mean, we did great things in your name. We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name, Jesus. And Jesus looked him in the face and said, depart from me, you doers of iniquity. I never knew you. We must examine what scripture says. We must examine what we say we believe, and we must examine what our life says about what we actually believe. I'm not saying if you've ever, you know, if you stumble, you had an argument, you, you spoke to somebody way you shouldn't have, I'm not saying that, you know, you're going to hell. But those things should bother you. When situations in our lives happen that are contrary to God's word, do we feel conviction about that? You know, if, 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 we've, if we've talked down to a coworker or we've, you know, been too harsh with our kids, does that bother us? Or do we just say, well, pff, my kids will get over it? No, you, we need to think about these kinds of things because God's word is spoken on all of these matters. And so which Jesus do you want? It's Palm Sunday. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem for the final time. And you guys are here. And you're, without saying it, you're saying, Hosanna, son of David, the, 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 the son of God who comes, save us. Your presence here is an admission of what you desire. Do your lives match what God's word says? Do they match your desires? Which Jesus is it that you want on Palm Sunday? Let's pray together. Father God, I, I thank you today that we don't have to wonder, we don't have to guess, we don't have to try to figure it out. We don't have to come to our own conclusions about who Jesus was and about what Jesus accomplished and about what the ramifications of that is upon our lives. God, there is so much confusion that exists today as it pertains to Jesus. And so many folks just exist functioning according to their own perspectives or ideas of who Jesus is or what Jesus is like. But Father, draw us to your word that we might see Jesus for who he is and that we might recognize him as the prophet, priest, and king. God, and that we might honor him with our lives. That if repentance is what is necessary today, maybe it's for the first time. Maybe it's true repentance to salvation. God, stir our hearts to that today. If it's repentance over sin uh, that's, that's crept into our lives, if it's repentance over uh, a truth of Jesus that we've exchanged for a lie, God, convict our hearts of that today. And help us to do the hard things. Because nowhere in your word do we find that it's easy to follow Jesus. In fact, we find the exact opposite. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to know and to understand and to admit, acknowledge, God, that we need your Holy Spirit we need your word, God. We need you to work in our hearts and our lives that we might follow after you. We just praise and thank you today, God, for your goodness to us. We thank you that we're not worshiping a political savior today, um, that Jesus wasn't just somebody who came to deal with a physical conflict, God, but that he was the spiritual savior who came and dealt with the greatest of conflicts, who came and, and, and dealt with the and delivered the greatest remedy um, that we could need, and that is... Uh, the, remedy of, uh, the remedy of his life for our sin. And so, Father, we thank you for that today and pray that you would stir our hearts uh, to these truths today, that you might be glorified and our lives might be changed. In Jesus' name we pray.